Today I'm looking at this one, The American Covenant by Marshall Foster. These are all good books, so I, I definitely recommend them. I believe the identity of America is very important, obviously. Uh, you can't let people who don't believe in God, who are, you know, uh, you know, pro-godless secularism, I mean, it's like, I mean, it is indeed a battle for the soul of America. And so, you really, I really, I, I, I uh, encourage, you know, Christian Americans not to be conceding to that idea or that false identity. For there is no such thing as a godless America, or an America without Christ, there is no such thing. And so that's why I read from these books, you know, and I recommend them. To remember the covenant with the Lord, that your identity is to be the American Zion. Not a godless secular nation. Okay. Only by the grace of God can you keep your republic. And so it's a lot of things that are God given. So that's why I'm reading from this book in this chapter seven. The genius of the genius of the American Republic. I just wanted to read briefly from it. And uh, here's a quote from Daniel J. Elarza. Elazar. The signing of the constitutional detail by Howard Chandler Christie. There's a portrait here. And I suppose it's basically the, if I could say the icon or canvas I have up there on my wall. And the quote reads it says, Just as the heart of the covenant of ancient Israel consists of two parts the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments with its electrifying statement of fundamental principles and the Book of the Covenant with its more detailed framework of basic laws of the Israelite commonwealth, so too does that of the American Covenant consist of two basic documents serving the same purposes, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of Daniel J. Elazar and the same con the, uh, Constitution right? that, you know, the documents that George Washington, James Madison, right? believe in its inspiration, American scripture. So that's why I believe that Americans should keep the divine element of the founding, the divine inspiration of the founding themselves. Let me continue reading, sorry. How can America be a Christian republic when under our constitution there is supposedly a separation of church and state? As we discussed in chapter 1, the founders were intent upon preventing any one denomination from imposing its views on a self-governing individual throughout the power of civil government. As we saw in chapter 6, um, as we saw in chapter 6, they view conscience and the most, as the most sacred of all property so that, you know, to be carefully protected by the government. When they wrote in the First Amendment to the Constitution, this quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, end quote. They made it clear that they would not live under a nationally established church that could demand their membership and financial support. It was the tyranny of religious conformity that they opposed. But to say that they intended a secular state in which religion would play no part flies in the face of all evidence to the contrary. They never envisioned a secular state where God's moral laws would be systematically and deliberately flouted. Yet this has come to pass. The spirit and the letter. Our state governments and the federal government were built largely upon principles that the founders derived from their study of the scriptures. The form of our republic still remains, but the spirit which is Christianity has been stifled. Without this animating spirit, the letter is dead. There's a quote here that says, To understand the American Christian Constitution as a Christian form of government, it is necessary to consider its two spheres, the spirit and the letter, the internal and the external, both spheres must be active in order that the Constitution function to preserve the basic Republican spirit of individual liberty. Today we still have the letter of the Constitution, that is, we still go through most of the legal processes of the structure of the Constitution in enacting legislation and in the executive and judicial branches, but the spirit which, has, which was intended and understood by the, our founding fathers is missing and has been for the last 100 years that that spirit was the Christian foundation of our Constitution. 
the faith of our fathers, as our nation has fallen away from its foundations, the essence of that faith, our constitution, has become a hollow shell. As Americans have forgotten the biblical foundation of their government, they have allowed a subtle, a subtle transform transformation of the doctrine of separation of church and state into a separation of religion and state, so that now Christianity can no longer receive a hearing in the schools, prayer and Bible reading are prohibited, the rights of Christian pastors to express their convictions on government matters in the pulpit, as our colonial pastors did, are curtailed and they are curtailed and penalized in an attempt to prevent all meaningful crit criticism of the secular state. Our founding, our founders established a republic, a republic, not a democracy. Because of because our form of government is derived and, and all its parts from the biblical principles, it cannot be understood without comprehending those principles, nor can it be made to work as our founding fathers intended. I said our founding fathers established uh, one republican government representing each individual rights, two separation of powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, in order to protect individual against the tyranny resulting from concentration of power. A. The legislative power to respect individual rights to his own life, liberty, and property and to his Christian self-government. B. Specifically limited powers for the presidency. C. The Supreme Court as the interpreter of law in accord with the Constitution which is ungirded by biblical law. 3. A dual system of government. A. The states retaining the power by most powers. B. The federal government having only those powers necessary for its sphere of authority. Today we have one. I said today we have, instead of that, I guess today we have uh, one, a majoritarian democracy representing the will of the majority, even when it tramples on the rights of the individual. Two, balance of powers which set by a increasing predominance of the presidency. B. The, the Supreme Court usurping the rights of the legislative branch. C. The most important branch and representative greatly um, weakened. It is A. A legislative branch that passes laws encroaching upon the individual's rights of self-government and his rights to his own life, property, and liberty. And B. Presidential powers frequently bypassing Congress through executive orders. C. The Supreme Court flouting biblical law and many of its rulings and often usurping the rights of the legislative branch. And number three, a strong unitary government with powers being absorbed by Washington, the states steadily losing their local self-government and sources of revenue to the federal government. This decline would never have come to pass if American Christians have not stepped aside from the political arena and retreated into purely personal religion, leaving the field of civil government largely to the secular humanists. Of course, if we had known the distinctively Christian nature of the elements of our government, we would not have turned out. Uh, we would not have turned our backs on our heritage, the biblical perspective of our founders. What is that identifies America as a Christian nation? What elements in our form of government are distinctly biblical? Every American should be able to answer this question. Contrary to the common belief today, most of our founders were serious Christians, and in contrast to the everyday person today, understood that every nation has a theological and philosophical basis. They, were they here today, they would not find it difficult to understand that even atheistic Marxist cultures are religious to, to the core, preaching by force the doctrine of man as the measure of all things. In their day, our founding fathers had the example of the failed French revolutionaries who were preaching much the same thing. Our founding fathers, with a few exceptions, were diametrically opposed to the atheistic path chosen by the French revolutionaries. Although quite true, it is important to remember that our nation was established as a Christian nation, not because all the founders or all the people were Christians, but because it was founded on the Christian view of man and government that prevailed at the time. Those who tried to dismiss the historical evidence that ours is a Christian republic often point to two or three unbelieving founding fathers as if they were representative of all the rest. But the contrary is true, and those few individuals had to bow before the prevailing Christian perspectives that surrounded them. The main elements of our government 
sprang from this perspective. Uh, President Harry Truman laid out the, the case for America's biblical foundations in a speech in 1950. They stood against the redacted antisodo revisionist histories sweeping into America's schools from John Dewey and the progressive socialist academics of the time. He foresaw what could happen if we forgot our covenant with the Almighty, he said. And it says, the fundamental, the fundamental basis of this nation's laws was given to Moses on, Mount, on the Mount. The fundamental basis of our Bill of Rights comes from the teachings we get from Exodus and St. Matthew, from Isaiah to Saint, and St. Paul. I don't think we emphasize that enough these days. If we don't have a proper fundamental moral background, we will finally end up with a totalitarian government which does not believe in rights for anyone except the state. The first pillar of the Constitution, the principle of representation. One of the fundamental elements of our new political system was a new phenomenon in the world. The American representative system of government, this system may justly be called the first pillar of the Constitution. In 1783, the Reverend Dr. Ezra Stiles, then president of Yale University, said in a speech, saying, All the forms of civil polity have been tried by mankind except one, and that seems to have been reserved in Providence to be realized in America and democratical polity for millions, standing upon the broad basis of the people at large, aptly charged with the property, has not hereto been exhibited. Setting the stage, before a representative system could be implemented, that would hold down the powers of tyrants. A whole chain of events had to bring about the miracle that was America. As we have seen in chapter 3, the Bible must get into the hands of the individuals. This gave them not only the, the, the desire for liberty, but the ability, skills, and wisdom needed for self-government, which in turn safeguards liberty. Second, a land had to be provided that was separated from the old world, despotism of monarchs, and separated, too, from the religious skepticism which was, the arri was to arise during, during the Enlightenment. Third, a people had to be prepared who shared a biblical worldview of the nature of man and government. The biblical view of man drove them to develop a form of government that would neither depend blindly upon the will of the masses nor give absolute power to one man. Now they knew that, as Lord Action, Action succinctly stated, quote, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, end quote. Why did they understand the corrupting nature of power so well? Because they shared the biblical view of sin and the sin nature of man. Therefore, they could not share the view of the French philosopher John Jacques Rousseau, that man is naturally that man is naturally good and able to be able to perfect himself. Nor could they share his enthusiasm for "quote unquote" general will. The general will could be dead wrong. It could trample on the God-given rights of the individual. But neither did they believe what King George had tried to tell them that they must bow to the decrees of the sovereign as a leader by divine by divine right. Is liberty and the things of God, the Christian organs of religious freedom. Robert Louis Wilkins. It's also a good book. I have the uh, I have the audible version of it. I wanted to buy a hard copy of it. She gives you the roots of Christian freedom. So I guess I'll read briefly from the introduction, kind of give you an idea of what it says. Religious freedom rests on a simple truth. Religious faith is an inward disposition of the mind and heart, and for that reason cannot be coerced by external force. This truth was stated for the first time by Ter Tertullian of Carthage, a Christian writer who lived in North Africa in the early 3rd century. Tertullian said, quote, It is only just and a privilege inherent in human nature that every person should be able to worship according to his own convictions. The religious practice of one person neither harms nor helps another. It is not part of religion to coerce religious practice, for it is by choice, not coercion, that we should be led to religion." End quote. Religious freedom is often thought to be the work of the Enlightenment. In the 16th century, so the story goes, when the Reformation took hold in Europe, confessional differences led to the suppression and persecution of Christians by Christians. 
As the decades passed, religious convictions hardened and Protestant and Catholic armies faced one another on the field of battle. A half century of bloody conflict, the so-called wars of religion, were set in motion. But by the middle of the 17th century, men with greater wisdom and less religious fervor came on the scene and the fanaticism of religious believers gave way to the core reason of the philosophers. Armed with notions of the superiority of reason over faith, skeptical of received truth, and distrustful of religious claims and institutions, these Enlightenment thinkers forged a new set of ideas about toleration and religious freedom. Through their efforts, the modern idea of liberty and conscience was born. This account portrays Christianity as inescapably intolerant and religion as prone to violence. Only with the decline of religious faith did religious freedom gain a foothold in the emerging secular states of Europe. As long as Christian beliefs were the spiritual and intellectual inspiration of society, toleration of those who believed differently made little headway. In recent years, some historians have begun to modify the dominant narrative, but they move within two, they move within a too narrow and historical swath that does not include the broad sweep of Christians thinking, uh, thinking reaching back to the scriptures, the church fathers, and the medieval teachers. Says, quote, we must retrieve those ancient sources, end quote, uh, writes John Witt, a scholar of human rights and religious freedom, quote, and reconstruct them for our day, end quote. This book is a modest effort to contribute to the enterprise, to understand how religious freedom came to be cherished as a fundamental human right. The story must begin long before the Enlightenment and the development of modern political ideas and institutions. Its origins are not political but religious, and its history is a tale of inwardness and of spiritual freedom and of obeisance aimed upward to see things in historical perspective. It began with Christian writers who lived during the years the new religion was first making its way in the Roman Empire. They did not forge a doctrine of religious freedom, and for centuries their thinking was only a quiet murmur heard by a few. In dealing with dissidents and minorities in the midst, Christians seldom act, acted on the basis of the principles set forth by the early teachers. They acted with violence against Jews in the Rhineland at the time of the First Crusade. They executed heretics, for example, for example, John Hus, the the Zek uh, reformer in 1415. Uh, they forced the conversion of Muslims in 16th century Spain. Nevertheless, writings defending the freedom and dignity of human beings were not forgotten and laid a foundation on which later generations would build as the inheritance of the past was buffeted quote, by the rough torrent of occasion. End quote. The Reformation of the 16th century, a doctrine of religious liberty, began to take shape. During the Reformation and in the 17th century, Christian thinkers had access to the writings of the Church Fathers, newly edited by humanistic scholars. The works of Tertullian, for example, were published in Basel in 1521 by Beatus Reynes of Schillestad, Advocate, advocates of religious freedom discovered that arguments used by the Church Fathers against Roman authorities could be refashioned to address Christian persecution of Christians in their day. In his treatise, whether heretics should be persecuted, Sebastian Castello, um, writing in response to the execution of Michael Severus in Geneva, quoted at length a passage from Lactinutus, a fourth-century Christian writer, quote, there is no room for force and violence because religion cannot be compelled. Let words be used rather than blows, that the decision may be free. End quote. By the beginning of the 17th century, collections of earlier Christian texts on religious coruscant were available and were regularly cited by defenders of religious freedom. The significance of certain traditional ideas, however, was discerned only as new events unfolded.
Pontus is a good example if Francentian sister in Nuremberg, Germany, Caritas Pergenheimer wrote a journal of the Reformation years, 1524 through 1528, recounting the travails of her coven of her covenant as the Reformation was being introduced in the city, and resisting the demands of the city council, Pergheimer and other members of her community forcefully forcefully stated that the Protestant reforms were against their consciousness. Reformers, she said, loudly proclaimed the freedom of the gospel, but would not grant them the freedom to act according to their consciousness. Her journal shows her journal shows that liberty of conscience was an inheritance inheritance from the medieval Christianity, in her view, and in that of other writers, it did not mean a right of private judgment, but the freedom to keep faith with the church's teachings and practices. Freedom was found in obedience to God. A few years, a few years later, Perkheimer wrote her diary. A prominent citizen in Nuremberg challenged the imposition of reform by the local magistrates, that is, by secular authorities, in his tract whether secular government has the right to wield the sword in matters of faith. George Froelich offered a vigorous defense of the right of new religious associations. He was thinking of Anabaptist societies to confess their distinctive beliefs, to gather for worship, and to win converts. Be fearful that Froelich's book would jeopardize the reform. The Nuremberg magistrates enlisted several theologians to refute his ideas and using the term sword. Froelich was one of the first to employ the medieval doctrine of the two powers or two swords to address the religious struggles of the 16th century. The secular sword he wrote, quote, is of no use in forcing people to adhere to this or that of faith, end quote, because belief rests on choice, not coercion, and recognizing that the civil authorities had to, had to find a way to accommodate minority religious communities in a society bound together by one religion. Froelich was prescient over the next several generations, the doctrine of the two swords or two realms in John Calvin's formulation was made to fit different political and religious environments. It became a recurring fixture in debates on religious freedom. In France, as the country became divided by the presence of quote unquote two religions, Catholicism and Calvinism, Michael D. Uh, Hopital, Chancellor of France, proposed that the government cease regulating uh, religious affairs. The French had often honored the medieval maxim, uni foi, uni lu, uni roi, sorry if I mispronounced that. It means one faith, one law, one king. But in a speech before the Estates General, Ayopital said it was not his task as Chancellor to make judgments about religious matters. The political assembly should be concerned about maintaining the republic not said maintaining religion. A century later a century later, his letter concerning toleration, John Locke held that it, quote, is above all necessary to distinguish exactly the business of civil government from that of religion, and to settle the just bounds that lie between the one and the other. End quote. So the book is an effort to bring together intellectual development of the 16th and 17th centuries on religious freedom with the inheritance received from early and medieval Christianity to that end the historical account will circle around uh, three themes first that religious belief is an inner conviction accountable to God alone and resistant to compulsion second that conscious is conscien conscience is a form of spiritual knowledge that carries an obligation to act third that human society is governed by two powers which is rendered to Caesar um, the things that are, are of Caesar and to God, the things that are of God, said Jesus of Nazareth. In his day, in his day, these words were re were referenced to the Roman Emperor and to the one God. As the sayings passed through time and the Emperor became a Christian, its meaning changed. But the divide between temporal rule and spiritual authority was never forgotten. In early modern Europe, it became a bulwark supporting liberty of conscience, 
there's a, there's a subsidiary motive first enumerated in the early church that came to full expression only in the 16th century with the emergence of the Reformation. Historians call, quote, confessionalization, end quote, organized religious communities with distinct, with distinct, with distinct doctrinal, liturgical, and spiritual systems. Religion is seldom an, 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 an individual matter without unique rites and ceremonies as well as organized fellowships. Religious faith cannot flourish. In the 16th century, Dutch writer put it, to quote, how is it possible to grant liberty of conscience without exercise of religion, end quote. Advocates of religious freedom defended the rights of religious communities to practice their faith publicly, as well as the liberty of individual conscience. In the 16th century, the 17th century ideas first launched in early centuries were taken up, modified, expanded, and adapted as the Reformation unfolded. Memory is indispensable to Christian intellect life, and nowhere was this more evident than in debates over religious freedom. Familiarity with early writers had a steadying effect on the judgments of religious and political thinkers, allowing them to see the conflicts of their own times with eyes trained by the seldom wisdom of the past. Although the term origins appears in the title of this book, I seek to discern not roots, but the ways the meditations of the past were fitted to the affairs of the later day. As the title indicates, this is a book about religious freedom, not toleration. Toleration is forbearance of that which is not approved. A political policy of restraint towards those who believes, whose beliefs and practices are objectionable. I wish to show how Christian thinkers came to consider religious freedom or liberty of conscience a natural right that belongs to all human beings, not an accommodation granted by ruling authorities. Significantly as the idea that religious believers should be guaranteed the right to practice their faith gain traction. Some thinkers drew the conclusion that this right belongs not only to Christians, uh, to Christian dissenters, but to all, including Jews and Muslims. This book does not offer a complete history of the rise of religious freedom in the West. It is an historical essay based on my reading of the sources and my judgments as to which thinkers and ideas best represent key lines of development. It aims to show that religious freedom took from uh, took form through the intellectual labors of men and women of faith who sought the liberty to love and serve God. Faithfully in the public square, John Clemenatz, the political philosopher, got things right when he wrote that liberty of conscience arose, this is quote, among people who had been taught for centuries that nothing was more important than to have the right beliefs. Now, this was, no doubt, the source of fanaticism and persecution but it was also, I suggest, the source of a new conception of freedom. Liberty of conscience was born not of indifference, not of skepticism, not of mere open-mindedness, but of faith." End quote. This is a pretty good book. I definitely recommend it. It's a book that transformed Rise and Fall and the Rise and Legacy of American Progressivism by Ronald J. Pescrito. America of the modern administrative state is not really American of the original constitution. This transformation comes not only from the ordinary course of historical change and development, but also from a radical new philosophy of government that was imported into the American political tradition by the progressives of the late 19th century. The new thinking about the principles of government and openly and open hostility to the American Constitution led to a host of concrete changes in America, American political institutions. Our government today reflects these original progressive innovations, even if they are often unrecognized as such because they have become ingrained in American political culture. This book shows the nature of these changes, both in principles and in the, and the nuts and bolts of governing. It also shows that how progressivism was often at the root of critical developments of subsequent to the progressive era and the more in the more recent American political history, how it was different than the New Deal, the liberalism of the 1960s, and today's liberalism, but also how these subsequent developments could not have transpired without the ground laid by the original 
progressives. That sounds pretty good. The Mox Bomb, this one. Myth of Religious Violence by William Cavanaugh. So the myth of religious violence is that religion is endemic to all human cultures and er eras and is prone to absolutism, divisiveness, and irrationality. Religion must therefore be separated and from quote unquote secular phenomena like politics for the sake of peace. The secular nation state appears natural. It corresponds to a universal and timeless truth about the dangers of religion. William T. Kavanaugh argues that this is a this is a way um, that this is a piece of Western folklore underwriting Western violence. Through a thorough genealogy of the concept, Kavanaugh shows that religion is not a universal and transhistorical phenomenon. Religious, secular, and religious political distinctions are modern Western inventions. Kavanaugh shows that what counts as religion and what counts as secular in any context corresponds to how power is arranged, both in the West and in the, in the lands colonized by the West. The myth of religious violence helps create and marginalize a religious quote-unquote other, prone to fanaticism to contrast with the rational, peacemaking, secular subject. Within the West, the myth underwrites the triumph of the emergent state over the church in the early modern period and the nation state subsequent monopoly on its citizens willingness a willingness to sacrifice and kill outside the west the myth of religious violence reinforces the superiority of western social orders to non-secular especially muslim social orders now, their violence is seen as fanatical our violence is justified as a rational means to peacemaking Examining academic, government, and journalistic sources, Kavanaugh shows how this myth is used to justify American diplomatic and military actions, including the recent Iraq War, peace, argues Kavanaugh, depends on a balanced view of violence and recognition that so-called secular ideologies and institutions can be just as prone to absolutism, divisiveness, and irrationality. Is the idea that religion has a tendency to promote violence is part of the conventional wisdom of Western societies, and it underlines many of our institutions and policies from limits on the public role of churches to efforts to promote liberal democracy in the Middle East. What I call the myth of religious violence is the idea that religion is a trans-historical and transcultural feature of human life, essentially distinct from quote-unquote secular features such as politics and economics, which has a peculiarity, a peculiarly dangerous inclination to promote violence. Religion must therefore be tamed by restricting its access to public power. A secular national state then appears as natural, corresponding to a universal and timeless truth about the inherent dangers of religion. In this book, I challenge this piece of conventional wisdom not simply by arguing that ideologies and institutions labeled quote-unquote secular can be just as violent as those labeled quote-unquote religious, but by examining how the twin categories of religious and secular are constructed in the first place. A growing body of scholarly work explores how the category of quote-unquote religion has been invented in the modern West and in colonial, colonial context according to specific configurations of political power. In this book, I draw on the scholarship to examine how timeless and transcultural categories of religion and the secular are used in arguments that religion causes violence. I argue that there is no trans historical and transcultural essence of religion and the essentialist attempts to separate religious violence from secular violence um, are incoherent. What counts as religious or secular in any given context is a function of different configurations of power. The question then becomes why such essentialist constructions are so common. I argue that in what are called quote unquote Western societies, 
the attempt the attempt to create a transhistorical and transcultural concept of religion that is essentially prone to violence is one of the foundational legitim legitimating myths of the liberal nation state. The myth of religious violence helps to construct and marginalize a religious other prone to fanaticism, a contrast to rational peacemaking secular subject. This myth can be and is used to domest in domestic politics to legitimate the marginalization of certain types of practices and groups labeled religious while underwriting the nation state monopoly on its citizens willingness to sacrifice and kill in foreign policy the myth of religious violence serves to cast non-secular social orders especially muslim societies in the, in the role of villain they have not yet learned to remove the dangerous influence of religion from political life their violence is therefore irrational and fanatical. Our violence, being secular, is rational, is rational peacemaking and sometimes regret regrettably necessary to contain their violence. We find ourselves obliged to bomb them with, into, into liberal democracy. Let's just stop there. So basically, that secularism isn't obviously it's not a friend, it's not neutrality. So at best you have, we have a, a sacred secularism, I guess if I can call it that, or Jefferson Wall and all that, in order to promote for the benefit of religious liberty, not for godless secularism. So I hope I've read enough to at least at least recommended some books uh, to show that our founding is is for sure foundationally Christian, and that our so-called irreligious or deistic founders have a very Christian nature to them. Um, of course, that's speaking of only a handful of them. They're also uh, the forgotten founders who are mainly Christian and so total about what, 250 founders, founding fathers, uh, founding fathers of America. Now 97% of them are Christian. And so that's why I recommend these books and I make these videos to, you know, kind of, you know, dispel the myth as a godless secular America, I believe there's no such thing. That uh, God has already provided for us our identity, our form of government, our, you know, our constitution, our founders, you know, all of that I believe is, is based on biblical principle. That is the predominant document of the Bible. So anyway, if you uh, like my videos, uh, please like and subscribe.